So yes, my name is Esther Peters. Uh, I am the Outreach and Campus Programming Coordinator at the Center for East European Russian Eurasian Studies. And if you don't actually want to try that, or never have to say that, we also go by series. Um, much easier. Uh, and it is my pleasure to introduce our next journal journalist, Zach Panic. Uh, he is a freelance producer, editor, and camera person who has worked for PBS, NewsHour, Al Jazeera, Vice News, Bakhmut, and SNBC, News Corp, Bloomberg TV, and The Daily Beast. Prior to his freelance work, he was a producer and editor at ABC News for close to a decade, working primarily for the flagship evening news show, World News Tonight. At ABC, Fanning was the recipient of both an Edward R. Murrow Award and an Alfred I. DuPont Award. Since 2012, he's chosen an entrepreneurial path towards journalism, reporting on international stories not usually covered by U.S. news organizations. He's been able to create work entirely on his own, pitching, developing, producing, shooting, editing, and writing. He was the first American journalist to raise questions about a series of extrajudicial killings of Muslim clerics in Kenya, and he reported exclusively on a Kenyan human rights document that detailed abuse of ethnic Somalis across Kenya. Subsequent to his reporting, this document was released publicly. He is embedded with Nigeria's army in its fight against Boko Haram and with Kenya's militarized police as they fought to curb radicalism in the coastal city of Mombasa. He has created video reports from southern Russia, including conflict zones in Chechnya and Dagestan, and he has reported from 11 countries in the past three years. And today he will be sharing with us his presentation entitled Using Multimedia to Report on Political Unrest in Russia. So please, let's uh, welcome Zach Pan. Thank you. 
Tonight, we begin a week-long series from Eastern Europe that we're calling Fault Lines. On Friday, NATO will announce the largest military buildup in Europe since the Cold War. Tensions between the West and Russia have reached the highest level since the fall of the Soviet Union. This week, we'll examine the causes of that tension. Tonight, we begin with Europe's only active front line in eastern Ukraine. For two years, fighters for the self-proclaimed Donetsk People's Republic, with the backing of Russia, have fought the Ukrainian government to gain autonomy. The West, including the U.S., is backing Ukraine's government. 10,000 people have died. With the help of the Pulitzer Center on Crisis reporting, special correspondent Nick Schifrin and producer Zach Fannin traveled to Donetsk and discovered that what is supposed to be a ceasefire is anything but. On the front line in eastern Ukraine, the war is fought in trenches. At the end of each trench, small outposts are manned by men who call themselves rebels. They fight to separate from Ukraine and join Russia. It's intense all the time, all the time. Ivan, who declined to give his last name, grew up in a nearby village. Their enemies, fellow Ukrainians fighting to stay united, are only a thousand feet away. I can see their positions over there. There's supposed to be a ceasefire, but the fighting starts every night. We have to go. On average, one fighter for the self-declared Donetsk People's Republic dies every day. This war is like going back a hundred years. This is a trench war, and you can hear some of the explosions in the distance and not very far away from us. These guys have been fighting here since January, and they say that the front line hasn't moved at all. What motivates you to be here? My home is five kilometers from here. How could I not fight if the war is so close? I decide to be useful here at last. Andrew, who also refused to give his last name, is former Soviet Special Forces. He says he came here to train a ragtag army. Or were you sent here by Russia? No, no, no. I'm a volunteer, so nobody, nobody pay me something. I don't see professionally uh, ready people. Mm -hmm. So I see taxis, I see drivers. Come. Guys, let's go. Okay. Their base used to be a local school. They resist Ukraine's alliance with Europe. They align with Russia. And as the war persists, their desire to separate grows. Once an army targets its own people, they become the enemy. Uh, how we can be in one state now? Uh, so you have to separate now. Sure. So, uh, they have to separate. 
The front is 280 miles long. To get to the village of Spartak, we needed an armed escort. On this front line, Anya, who also declined to give her last name, leads what she calls an infantry brigade. The professional Russian soldiers here, whom U.S. officials say number in the thousands, are invisible. So as we walk down this road, what is the risk here? Total risk. We're now walking in their sniper scopes. Here, everything is within their sniper's reach. We've been here just a few minutes when we heard the incoming bullets above our head, so we've taken cover, or at least staying low right now, and we're beginning to hear rebel soldiers beginning to fire back. Like many of these fighters, Anya is not a trained soldier. She was a successful chain store owner, but she's become a true believer in a pro-Russian and anti-European future. The entire Ukraine is fighting with us following NATO orders. They are nothing on their own. You are writing that I'm a blonde separatist who will come and start killing your children. Yes, I'll do just that. Are you willing to die for this cause? Yes, of course. I'm ready to die for my home. I will not let a single fascist into my home. I will fight them as long as my heart beats. When she and the city use fascist, it's inspired by the Soviet Union's role in the war against fascist Nazi Germany. In May, a downtown parade celebrated the Soviet Union's World War II victory. Today, the children of World War II veterans say this war is against the same enemy. <laughs> Training for that war starts young. Teenage girls spend Saturday afternoons with Russian Kalashnikovs. The average Russian soldier needs more than 10 seconds to do this. 15-year-old Katerina needs 9 seconds. <laughs> Since I was little, I preferred playing football with boys to playing with dolls. Next up, Soviet hazmat suits. Their teacher, Sergei Fomchenko, is a former Soviet soldier and police officer. Why, when we look toward Russia, do they call it a crime? In general, the whole of eastern Ukraine aligns with Russia. I would like us to be part of Russia. Upstairs, he shows me where a rocket struck this school. Ukraine and Russia have agreed Donetsk should eventually reintegrate into Ukraine, but everyone we spoke to rejected that. Would you ever be able to go back to Ukraine? A lot of blood was spilled. Many people died. Graduates of this school and other schools are now in the army. For what? To go back to Ukraine? I think it won't happen. So the training continues. They know their AKs by heart. When they're not training, they're proselytizing. The Donetsk military is short on recruits, so the girls hand out recruiting flyers to fighting age males, anyone between 18 and 55. Katerina also rejects returning to Ukraine because of what this war has forced her to see. There was a shell in my apartment block. Everything was blown up. When someone you know gets injured or killed, it's very hard to keep going. That unwillingness to reunite means Donetsk, with the help of Russia, is becoming more and more autonomous. Downtown, city workers whose salaries are paid by Russia look after public gardens. In supermarkets, the shelves are stocked with Russian products. The only currency accepted is Russian rubles. Residents try and lead normal lives. In the main square, with the Vladimir Lenin statue, families rent toy cars by the hour. In the opera house built under Stalin, a matinee showing of Giuseppe Verdi's Mass Ball. The audience was about two thirds full at $3 a ticket. And across the street at the Chicago nightclub, an Italian band invited by the local government delivers distraction and ideology. <laughs> But this city is an orphan. 
The Donetsk People's Republic was birthed with the help of Russian soldiers. Today it's not claimed by Russia, and it's isolated from Ukraine. There are no working banks, and no way to pick up pensions. The best salary in town is a soldier's, $225 a month. Vadim Bezi and Alexander Garaykin are both 17. Right now, there are no prospects here. The best option in terms of opportunities is to go abroad, for example, to America or England. But that's impossible because they're physically stuck. They can't get Ukrainian passports, and their Donetsk IDs allow access only to Russia. For those without the means to leave the front lines, life's even more difficult. Valentina Nikolaevna sleeps in her cellar because she's scared of shelling. She hasn't had running water or electricity in two years. Has it been worth it? During the Second World War, it took us, the Soviet Union, four years to cross half of Europe. Here it's been two years and we're in the same spot. And can you just describe how difficult life has gotten? I would have never believed it if two years ago you had told me I was going to live in a basement. Very hard. Nearby, this is all that's left of the Donetsk airport. It was built only four years ago. Down the street, this neighborhood is full of homes partially or completely damaged. But this is where we found Zakharovna Vladimirovna and her three-year-old grandson, Peter. They've spent nearly the entire war on these streets. They invited me in their home. Her husband, Zarkarov Pavlovich, grew up in this house. A Ukrainian rocket landed in their backyard. There were so many rockets, we just heard the noise of one above us. This collection of bricks used to be their bomb shelter. They stay because they fear looters. They both agree they've suffered, but don't necessarily agree on the solution. Good people from around here were killed. They were good guys. What did they die for? We have always known this part of Ukraine was very different from the rest, but we didn't know that they hated us so much. We want to have autonomy here. <laughs> that desire to separate means they'll keep fighting, but they can't overpower their enemy, so the front lines will remain frozen in place with little chance of a thaw. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Nick Schifrin in Donetsk. Mm, tune in tomorrow as Nick Schifrin continues his reporting from the other side as Ukraine fights not only the war in its east, but deep corruption from within. Game conflicts in Chicago. Yeah. The front never moves and nothing gets accomplished.
You know, essentially help out these people that you know need my help as a combat veteran. And he said that Russia wasn't paying him. So there is documented proof that Russia has sent so you know it's a money into Ukraine and uh, Putin is always denying this. Uh, Vice actually did this incredibly good documentary called Selfie Soldiers where they found that Russian soldiers Facebook postings that have geotags on all the pictures and put those photos in the geolocations in East Ukraine on the war. So that's pretty irrefutable evidence that, you know, Russian military has been in East Ukraine. Um, the reporter done that, that, that did that is now banned from Russia. <laughs> so, you know, Russia literally, by sending, you know, by doing that, sends a clear, <laughs> it is effectively confirming uh, that scope. So, during this last trip to Russia, we really wanted to get the uh, idea of somebody like Andrew who we met last year to get his side of the story and why would somebody be motivated to leave their peaceful life in Russia to go join a war in Ukraine. Do they feel as strong as some of Ukrainians do that they are that connected to Russia? Um, so, this clip is we worked in progress for a few weeks on air on July 10th on the news hour. And it starts off with a guy named Alexander Cuban, who I guess is the best way, the best way to think of him, because this is halfway in the middle of the piece. The full piece is done, so I can't show it to all people. But it's half of it, and it's the back half. But Alexander Dugan is the Steve Bannon for, you know, for Vladimir Putin, and Steve Bannon and Trump is, you know, the sort of Architect of a lot of the nationalist agenda. And Alexander Dugan was the one who came up with this idea of Novo Rosita, which is reclaiming both Crimea and Ukraine for Russia because these are the historically Russian pieces of land. And as NATO got closer to borders, Russia felt it needed to counterpunch. And its counterpunch was to take that Eastern Ukraine and take that Crimea. So this is, it starts with Dugan in his own words. Uh, about the sort of different mentality of, uh, of the Russian people versus the U.S. people. The idea that the state is more important than the people is actually not new. Russians have long had a collective identity. For us, the man is collective concept. We consider ourselves to be the part of the whole. So to be Russian means to share the same, the same cultural and historical identity. For years, TV fixture and firebrand Alexander Dugin inspired the Kremlin's ideology. He says Russia's collective identity comes from patriotism, projection of power, and respect for the ruler. Putin taps into all three, connecting today's Russia to its imperial grandeur. Patriotism is organic, it is not artificial. Empire or state is not something additional or artificial. Because it is our breath, our skin, our organic way of life. Today's Kremlin uses that patriotism to try and unite the population and convince them only a powerful state can protect them from enemies. Enemy number one, the US. America is on the brink of a revolution. Dugan and the Kremlin accused the U.S. of humiliating Russia by expanding NATO to Russia's borders and supporting revolutions in former Soviet states and satellites. Dugan advocates fighting back by attacking the West with asymmetric war. You talk about introducing geopolitical disorder, actively supporting dissident movements, extremism, racist, sectarian groups. This seems much more than just 
uh, exactly as you do. Tone. It's Ex exactly what you do. You are supporting separatist group. You are supporting any kind of uh, nationalism, including Russian nationalism that is against Putin. My and words are the mirror of what you are doing. It is mirror and you are right so much because you are doing the same thing against us. <laughs> In Ukraine, that philosophy was weaponized. In eastern Ukraine, Russia aids local separatists who fight against the Ukrainian government that's pro-Western. And in 2014 in Crimea, Russia helped install separatist leaders who rushed through a referendum that led to Crimea's annexation. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. The day of annexation, Putin gave a speech combining religion, patriotism, and imperial history. He said the West had been subjugating Russia, and Russia was finally demanding respect. If you compress the spring all the way to its limit, it will snap back hard. Russia is an independent, active participant in international affairs. Like other countries, it has its own national interests that need to be taken into account and respected. It is impossible to overstate how transformative eastern Ukraine and here Crimea have been in recent Russian memory. After the Crimea annexation, Putin's popularity spiked to nearly 90 percent. Russians told pollsters that suddenly they felt like a superpower again. And Russians all over the country mobilized. That's Denis Solomon in 2014, fighting in eastern Ukraine. He's a former soldier who was working a mid-management retail job when he quit and crossed the border. Now, we hear that behind us. There's an intense battle. Mortars and shells are raining in our direction. Solomon went to war because of that collective Russian identity. He believed the Ukrainian government was attacking ethnic Russians. Those people who were under fire, I identified them as Russian people who needed protection by those who can at least hold a weapon. What was it about them that you felt, I need to help them? Those are the people with the same culture as mine, the same language, the same worldview. He was convinced of that by propaganda. In May 2014, dozens of pro-Russian separatists died in Odessa, Ukraine. It probably became the pivotal moment. There was a lot of information about how people were simply getting beaten and killed. Russian media exaggerated the attack, even using an actress to play a victim. We know she was an actress because she appeared in unrelated pro-Russian stories as three entirely different people. That disinformation campaign convinces the Kremlin's critics the new Russian identity is manufactured, a product of deception and repression. Sometimes that repression shows up in masks, guns, and camouflage. Those are special forces surrounding 66-year-old Ilmi Umarov in the jacket and jeans. Umarov is a leader of the Tatars, a Muslim minority in Crimea. He and other Tatars fight the Russian annexation. In response, many Tatars have been jailed on questionable charges, and Umarov was thrown into a local insane asylum. So this all together we call one big act of intimidation. The purpose is to silence some and keep others ignorant, turn them into zombies so they think the same thing. These are the necessary conditions in order for the people to be loyal to their government. But do you acknowledge that that is the majority of the population who feels that way? Of course, of course. We can't say that this is a stupid population or stupid people. They're just living in a constellation of fear, and the propaganda machine rolls over them like a steamroller. Umarov may accuse Putin of manipulating the population, but under Putin, Russia has revitalized the majority religion, brought back historic traditions, and projects power. So until there's an alternative, he's considered the creator and will remain the caretaker of the new Russian identity. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Nick Schifrin in Krasnodar, Russia. Now, uh, you know, there's a little bit more understanding. So now we got to get Dennis's story. So when we were in Dennis, it was incredibly hard. It's impossible to really find out why any of the soldiers were there. One, it was a year ago, and Russia was still very defensive about being um, part of this war, uh, you know, officially. They still are, but, you know, uh, not as much so, because in southern Russia, where Jets lived, that's lives, there's literally, so let me show you on the map, it also helps explain how these people are so connected. 
So we were here in Krasnodar, and Donetsk is right about here. This is about, you know, maybe an hour and a half by car uh, apart. So, um, you know, in Venice in mind, um, this is all right in Russian land, and as Alexander Dugan has explained, look, as Russians, we don't think of ourselves as individual people, we think of ourselves as a collective unit that is able to defend the interests of the motherland, if you will. Um, so, you know, this is a way that the state can sort of reach its power out, you know, at a massive scale. Uh, Yeah. I would like to know, as a journalist, what percentage of your goal is to educate people who are watching you? I think that's explicitly your goal. Yeah. 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 Not being less explicit because I feel like if I think about using these in my class, I think that all the explicit history I have to tell them is you. Thank you. 
Because I mean, even as you started to tell the story to us, you first started by giving us some sort of background information that you don't do that in the story. Like, if you look at like CBC as opposed to like American news, they're really explicit about giving you a very unbiased perspective. Like, these are the things that you need to know in order to understand why this is happening. And I notice all the time that news doesn't do that. And I'm just wondering why you tell that story as if it doesn't have a history, but it's just about these people located in. Thank you. 
As a journalist who's kind of gone into the conflict zones around the world, have you seen any changes in terms of like safety for journalists on the front line? Because I know there's been a lot recently.
It is no accident that the youth are tempted to go to Syria, because today there is a revival of Islam. Kazim Nurmagomedov is 62 years old and his son fought for ISIS. He was never tempted to go to Syria, but he and his wife Rashida understand why their son Murat was. The Islamic call I was talking about, the one in every Muslim soul, is hidden deep down. It's like a light in someone's heart. Nurmagomedov lives deep in the Caucasus Mountains, where nearly dried up rivers meander through thousand foot high cliffs. And beyond ancient rock formations, isolated dirt roads connect secluded villages. One of those villages is Karada. Official population is 4,000, but residents say it's half that size. This area is nearly 100% Muslim. Before Friday prayers, men greet each other in the small town center. There are few young people, in part because this village sent as many as two dozen to ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and the wars in Syria and Iraq. That's her. That's her daughter. Okay. Amina Kondakova is a Muslim convert. She shows me photos from a happier time. That's very cute. She says they grew up traditional and comfortable. And then two years ago, her daughter Miriam and her son Ali Ashkat told her they were going on vacation. Instead, they traveled with Miriam's husband to Mosul, Iraq, to join ISIS. They lied to me about going there. I was so disappointed. And then I became afraid about what could happen to them. She says this town is pious but wasn't religious enough for her daughter. Did she feel judged by people in this society? Yes, they gave her looks. They didn't like how she was dressing. They wanted her to dress like everyone else. She wanted to dress the way it's written for a Muslim woman to dress. Kondakova believes that judgment drove her daughter away. She reluctantly admits that in Mosul, her daughter is happy, raising her first grandson. Mom, I feel like I was reborn here. I regret all those years I spent in Dagestan. Don't you want to come here too? I want to live with you. I want you to see my boy growing up. Nurmagomedov gets to see his grandson. When his son Murat left for Syria, he abandoned a pregnant wife. Alexei is now three years old. They look at photos of Murat as a boy and a young Murat clowning around with his older brother, Shamil. When you look at these, does it make you wish that your sons could all be here with you together? I am a realist. I know there's no return. Life isn't a book where you can tear out the pages if you didn't like what you wrote and write new ones. The Dagestanis who fought for ISIS continue a decades-old legacy here of radicalism and militancy. There's been a local insurgency here in the capital of Dagestan, Mahaj Kala, for years, targeting both local authorities and symbols of the national government. Their most prominent attacks targeted civilians in larger cities. In Moscow in 2010, militants allied with al-Qaeda blew up the subway. In 2013, in Volgograd, they blew up a bus station and then a commuter bus, as seen on Russian media. There was no social or physical protection. Every day there were bombings, terror attacks that cost people's lives. Habib Magomedov is a former police lieutenant colonel and member of Dagestan's anti-terrorism committee. He says conservative Islam, combined with high rates of unemployment and poverty, to radicalize. It's the living conditions, absence of possibilities, absence of social mobility, which creates waves of anger and distress. There has to be some sort of history that sets the person on a certain track where you only need to light a match for the fire to start. That match is often a brutal security crackdown. In January 2013, Russian special forces flooded into Dagestani villages. Locals say security services have practiced collective punishment against entire families, torture, even extrajudicial executions. Magomedov admits they went too far, but he tries to explain their motivation. If keeping people safe requires limiting rights and freedoms of certain individuals, it's probably worth it. My brother died in 1998 when someone threw a grenade in his house. You know, the freedom of one man ends where the freedom of another starts.
Um, you you see any connection between what you saw in Northern Nigeria and uh, what you saw in um, Ukraine? So that was, thank you for that picture of the clip. That was really, really fascinating to watch. Um, and I wanted to know, because as you said, journalists, it usually doesn't matter what we think, we're just trying to tell the story. But what was it like going in um, to
Yeah, just comment. Um, first of all, thank you for the. For this kind of work is dangerous. It's um, it's challenging as you just laid out, um, but so important and true to the first draft of history, which is you know more than you know. It's not a cliche. You talk about this kind of work. Um, the uh, if talk if you were talking to students who were curious about you know the um, personal danger that you find yourself in, um, how do you how do you uh, how do you respond to sort of you know how do you look out for your well being and mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Was that on a party trip? But what surprised me, maybe I didn't understand this, her daughter wanting to dress more conservatively yeah, in we're... Pakistan, and it seemed like a lot of the men were religious, but the younger generation saw her as an outsider. Are you, what city are you based in?